Welcome to all of you. Um, this is the first Vijay Thiruvadi Memorial Lecture, and we're very pleased to have with us Professor Mahesh Rangarajan, whose lecture is titled India Ecologica, Revisiting India's 20th Century Environmental History. How the 20th century shapes our present and will influence our future is common point of debate in India. Human actions via technological choices or the ways land and water are governed influence the non-human entities we share spaces with and knowing how, to got, how we got to where we stand matters. India's recent environmental past have bearing not only on this country but Asia and the world at large. Professor Mahesh Rangarajan has written and worked on these issues extensively, and it is particularly appropriate that he should be giving the first lecture in memory of Vijay, since nature and the environment were close to Vijay's heart, and Vijay had high regard for Professor Rangarajan and his work. Also, this kind of broad sweep through history was often what Vijay did in his walks, talks, and writing. I'd like to mention the presence with us today of Vijay's wife, Mrs. Meera Thiruvadi, and their son, Mrityunjay. <laughs> Unfortunately, their son, Dhananjay, and family could not be here. Vijay Thiruvadi was a member of the Bangalore International Center, and with this program, the BIC remembers his contributions in three landmark lectures here on the greening of Bangalore with Girish Karnad and Captain Prabhala, who's here with us in 2015, on botanical illustrations with Nirupa Rao in 2019, and on why Lalbagh matters in 2021. This lecture on the BIC's website has been widely viewed as an introduction to the botanical garden and to Bangalore and its history. And among the accounts of our city, uh, his book on which the lecture was based, Lal Bagh, Sultan's Garden to Public Park, published by the Bangalore Environment Trust, and it's available outside, presents the most comprehensive history of Lal Bagh, written to date. Uh, it ranges over five centuries, and is based on research from several archives, including Kew Gardens and the Royal Botanic Gardens, uh, Edinburgh, and most importantly, on Vijay's intimate knowledge of Lal Bagh, having conducted inspiring nature walks for over 18 years that were attended by over 15,000 walkers for whom, under the green canopy of Lal Bagh, the luminous botanical world came alive. Vijay used to joke that, um, you know, about uh, 2,000 species in Lal Bagh I've got. Maybe about 50 I haven't quite got to. <laughs> so. Um, Vijay was always interested in various aspects of nature, and more specifically, horticulture. In addition to the Green Heritage Walks in Lal Bagh, he conducted Imperial Colonial Walks in Carbon Park and Military Heritage Walks at the MEGNC, and participated in the various activities of Bangalore Environment Trust as a trustee. These have included the publishing of notable books on heritage trees in and around Bangalore and on Devrakadus and Gundutopus in the vicinity of Bangalore. Vijay spent his early years in Delhi. His academic interests were pursued at St. Stephen's College, Delhi, and School of Architecture, Ahmedabad. When in Delhi, he had exposure to the world of nature and environment through association with a number of distinguished people in the field and institutions. As many of you know, he grew up in the home of his grandfather, the renowned scientist, Dr. K. R. Krishnan in Delhi, and was part of the world of early post-independence Nehruvian India. Vijay also remained close to Indian science all his life and was involved in the design of the Uti radio telescope and the Vainu Bapu opt optical telescope when he worked for TCS. In his retirement, Vijay gave talks on Bangalore its environment and history at many institutions. A gifted raconteur, his encyclopedic knowledge of trees and of Bangalore's history were conveyed through stories that kindled a love of nature and made his walks, lectures, and books memorable, connecting with young and old from around the world, from experts in the field to school children. For those of us who knew him personally, he was a thorough gentleman and left an indelible impression on everyone he met. 
Through rain or shine, in sickness and in health, he was there every weekend, an institution in our city, giving thousands of Bangaloreans and visitors a greater appreciation of Bangalore and its green heritage. His passing last August is a profound loss to the city. So now, Arun Pai, who worked with Vijay for 18 years on Bangalore Walks, will give a personal tribute on his association with Vijay, and this will be followed by the lecture. Okay, good morning. I met Vijay in 2005. I was young, chucked my corporate career, wanted to start Vox. He was 64, a successful, in the middle of a corporate career. He was an architect, he was an engineer, he was not a botanist. He came on my first walk, he said, this is nice. He said, come on a walk with me to Lalbagh. I went to them and I said, wow, this man is special. So we developed a Lalbagh walk together and for 18 years, both of us conducted walks across Bangalore. So this is my little personal tribute to him. I thought I'll try and bring him into the room for those of you who have seen him or if there are some of you who have never been with him, hopefully these five minutes will give you an insight into the man. <clears throat> what people find surprising was when he started the walks, he had never conducted a walk in his life. He had never spoken to more than one person. All the knowledge was in his head and remained with him. And over the last 18 years, the good thing is that he had touched thousands of people. He did over a thousand walks for 18 years, which in my view is a record not just for India, but probably for the world. Rain or shine, he was there every weekend through the year, which was incredible. That's the earliest photo I could find of him in 2006 when he did his walks under his favorite tree. Some of you may know the ficus krishne. He just loved this tree, his favorite picture. <clears throat> this was what Vijay would do. He would regale people at the silk cotton tree. We had the United Nations come to Bangalore and so for the government of Karnataka he did walk. So these were really important people in 2007 and you know, he took them out. This is a typical group, there would be some Indians who were interested, some foreigners, they all showed up. A typical group every weekend of Vijay wearing his trademark hat, which he wore until 2015 I think. He the good thing about Vijay was he could deal with all audiences and a lot of people are sometimes a bit, they can deal with students or with, see, he dealt with everybody. So this is a group of Germans. Uh, brought by the German consulate. This is a typical Bangalore crowd. I suspect all of them knew Lalbagh backwards, but still they like to go with him. Everyone loved a photo with him at the end. He could talk to kids, which was incredible. He could speak to children, he could speak to experts, he could speak to everybody. And that was, I think, a special skill. He was very proud of this. I can read out a bit. When Girish Karnat came at the very beginning, I have never had such a delightful time re-exploring a venue I thought I knew intimately. And that was the essence of Vijay. He could make uh, any place magical, whether you're going there for the first time or you've been there all your life. You may not know him, but he's the guy behind the new Bangalore Airport Terminal, Prasanna Desai of B Bangalore Airports. And he came and three of us had a five-hour walk in Lalbagh. So Vijay inspired a lot of people, professional horticulturists, scientists, the whole works. And MTR at the end. We made that a speciality. He would take people to MTR, he would tell them stories. This, I'm sorry to say, was the last photo taken of him. It was in late July. He was in, And this was the last walk I think he conducted and he took everyone to MTR and thankfully we got that picture. So the entire span of Vijay's uh, walking career we, we managed to find. Uh, Covid had a silver lining. Because of Covid, I decided to get together with Vijay and record a series of videos, which I'm so glad I did. We brought out 10 videos. I have lots of footage more. It is invaluable, priceless footage. Um, and I will try to show you some of the footage I collected right now, just so that we can remember him better. Uh, when the Deccan Herald interviewed me, I said I consider him the David Attenborough of India. Uh, and they published that and I, I maintained that he could engage people with the storytelling. Uh, there's nobody else I know in India who could engage people like this. And this is how he would do, you know. He'd take people on a walk, he'd ask you to pick something up. It was very tactile. ask people to smell it, he'll have a story for everything. This was Vijay's favorite tree, the ficus krishne. I don't know how many of you have been on the walk with him and seen this tree. <coughs> uh, it was a tree that he just 
a beautiful video on it it's a very rare tree he did so much research on it he was not a botanist but he knew far more than people in the field and he, he consulted with the experts and you know maybe one day he would have written a paper on it it didn't happen so in botanical nomenclature now it is called uh, ficus bengalensis which is banyan variety krishna hard nal but very i i love to to see the the plasticity of the branches you know how it just you know which you don't quite have in the banyan the banyan the branches go off and then prop roots come or rather roots come they become prop roots and it's all vertical lines but here yeah, yeah. you can see the almost boyish glee in his you know and he said the story thousands of times but every time we talked about the tree he was so caught up on it that was spontaneous now he was also an architect by training he was a geologist you could name it he would do it which is why what uh, dr rangrajan's talk is so appropriate because the wide sweep of history is what he spoke about so i picked a small clip of everyone knows the glass house in lalbagh it is the, so once when he spoke in front of the glass house this third 20 second clip of how he described the architecture of the glass house have a look at the a uh, glass house right behind me in 1851 the great international exhibition was planned in hyde park in london there was a competition among architects for the building which would house the great international exhibition all the architects designs were rejected by the committee selection committee then two weeks afterwards the head gardener of the duke of devonshire called paxton came up with a design based on glass and that is because he made the glass houses green houses for his patron who is familiar with the material so he submitted a design for a three story structure which was made of glass wrought iron and a, and wood and the selection committee said this won't stand you know because the pillars holding up uh, each floor it was a three story building were very narrow so he said he had based the uh, design on a plant structure that is the victoria regia the victoria amazonica which has this nearly 10 foot uh, wide uh, lily pad and it stand up at the ends and that lily pad is stands on its own independently of the buoyancy of water i mean i've seen photographs in the lanos in south america of an anaconda which must have weighed about 100 pounds curled up on a lily pad and the lily pad is about 5 inches above the water now what paxton discovered was the lily pad has radial ribs on the underside and then it has cross ribs like the spider's web and it has little packets so it's got a buoyancy of its own so he decided that this could be used in man's architecture because whatever weight you seem to put on it on the lily pad is transmitted to the ground through a narrow slender elegant stem so he said he would use exactly that design for his crystal palace what got to be called the crystal palace to prove to the selection committee that the structure was very strong the lily pad he actually took his daughter and it Uh, to a lily pad uh, in one of the glass houses he put a 7 year old daughter and it on a lily pad which was above the ground of water and nothing happened to her or the lily pad that is when he got the contract actually you know for the crystal palace so this is the only uh, remaining structure which reminds you of the crystal palace in hyde park vijay spoke impromptu his language was impeccable i used perfect terms and the last piece i'm going to leave you with is a pure voice clip uh, vijay was also brilliant in his voice so i've just got his picture and he speaks about how we all came to be the rock on which bangalore stands which was the part of the most stunning thing i heard from him in 2005 it's a one and a half minute recording which is the foundation of bangalore the deccan plateau and i think will segue perfectly into the next speech so this is vijay at his favorite lalbagh rock to start with lalbagh is very very special in many ways today we talk about the little walled in area uh, which is a public park and a botanic garden but we can go right back to, to gondwana land which broke up into four or five pieces and one of them was the indian tectonic plate which moved northwards 
and finally collided with the Eurasian continent, created the Tibetan islands and the Himalayas, and the great river valley systems, the Indus, Brahmaputra, and the Ganges were formed after that. Down in the peninsula, halfway between uh, both Mangalore and Madras, right in the center of the plateau at 3,000 feet, Bangalore city was formed. The formation of the peninsula and the rock which uh, just out in Lalbagh is quite, quite spectacular. Netherworld rocks from the center of the earth, hypogene and trappian rocks, all of them under great pressure and temperature, all of them molten and all of them going towards the surface of the earth. Before they hit the surface of the earth, they mix with the molten magma, finally break through and then raft onto the lithosphere of the earth and then stabilized three billion years ago, 3000 million years ago. And the Lalba rock, as we see today, is an outcrop of th that prodigious outburst. This rock is something which geologists from all over the world come to, to study even today. And they, it signifies a material which has undergone plutonic, vol volcanic and sedimentary cycles, all telescoped into each other more than once, leading to deformation and metamorphism. And that is what we see in Lalbagh today. It's the finest place in the world to study the formation of the earth. Yeah, wasn't he special? As I said, the light has gone out of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Arun, for that wonderful evocation of Vijay. We now move on to the main section of our program, the lecture by Professor Mahesh Rangarajan. For a brief introduction, Mahesh Rangarajan is Professor of History and Environmental Studies at Ashoka University, Haryana. He did a BA in History from Hindu College, University of Delhi, and did his MA in Modern History and PhD respectively, at Balliol and then Nuffield College, Oxford. He has taught at the universities of Cornell, Jadavpur, Delhi, and at Kriya University, <clears throat> and the NCPS Bengaluru. His many books include Fencing the Forest, India's Wildlife History, and Nature and Nation. He edited the Oxford Anthology of Indian Wildlife and Environmental Issues in India. There are several other co-authored and co-edited works, including Battles Over Nature, Making Conservation Work, and Environmental History. He was chair of the Elephant Task Force of the Government of India in 2010, and has been director of the then Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, and also been vice chancellor of Kriya University. Professor Rangarajan was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University and was awarded the T.N. Kushu Memorial Prize in Environment and Development in 2015. In 2021, he was elected overseas member of the American Historical Association, only the fourth Indian to be so elected. A detailed bio is on the BIC website. So without further ado, I turn the floor over to Professor Mahesh Rangarajan. Thank you very much, uh, Pratiti, uh, for a very generous, I would say overly generous uh, introduction. Uh, Mrs. Tirubadi, uh, members of his family, uh, distinguished friends, it's a great honor and uh, privilege to be here today. Um, it's also a very poignant moment. Uh, I was struck by the last uh, words of the former speaker when he said the light uh, has gone out of our lives. I was struck by it for more than one reason. You know, the year I was born, it's no great secret, 1964, saw the death of uh, probably one of the most significant environmental thinkers, and I would say practitioners, of the 20th century, Rachel Carson. And uh, Rachel Carson was someone whose spirit lived on in the walks of uh, the late uh, Vijay Tiruvadi. I I'm going to share with you a famous quote of hers which says, those who dwell among the beauties and mysteries of the earth 
are never alone or weary of life. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. The more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe, the less taste we shall have for its destruction. I think, uncanny as it is, these words appropriate as, the were, as they were for her time and her place, and as I would think are appropriate for our time and our place, are uh, perhaps even more apt for the life and the message of someone who, in a sense, invented and recreated a new life, not for himself, but for all those who were privileged enough to accompany him on his walks. I'm always struck by late Girish Karnat Sahib because there's something very fascinating in that short uh, quote of his, where it said that he had been on this walk before, but it peeled off so many layers that he would never see the reality in quite the same way again. In a sense, that is the challenge for anyone who attempts uh, to do a history. History, as we all know, is about stories. It's about stories of the past. Uh, as uh, inevitably one gets asked by relatives, and I'm sure you'll all be familiar with this, we live in a city and a country where studying medicine, engineering, mathematics, science, and so on is seen as the acme of perfection. And history is something which is something like a laggard in the, in the bush. So you're always asked, what kind of history do you study? Do you really know what happened? Can we really know what happened? How does it really matter whatever happened in the past? I'm afraid it does matter, not because the past necessarily shapes the present, but you cannot prepare for the future without having a sense of the past. Everybody has a sense of the past. We have memories, we have ideas, we have received wisdoms, we have things which we think are home truths. I think it was Keynes who once said that much of what we take to be common sense is but distilled prejudice. And this perhaps applies even more when we think of histories in relation not only to the human world, but to the environment. The 20th century was one like no other in world history. It was a time when, as we all know, the map of the world was unfurled and remade. Some would say unmade, I would use the term remade. At the dawn of the 20th century, there were great empires. You can remember them if you talk to any school child. Uh, there were many European empires that vanished by the end of the century and the vanishing or the beginning of the vanishing of the British Empire in this part of the world in the late 1940s was one part of the process of that drawback of European domination which had dominated much of the previous few centuries. Whether we begin with 1492 or 1767 depending which dates you want to pick. The other of course was the rise of new nation states. Uh, Today, there are about four times the nation states as they were in 1914. There were 50, now there are nearly 200. I'm cheating a bit, there are 192. The other change, of course, is there are more people on the earth than they were. Uh, for every one person in 1900, there were four times as many by 2000. These are all well-known facts. What may not be quite widely known is something John McNeil tells us, that the world's economy grew 14-fold in that 100-year period. There was more wealth created in that 100 years than the previous 100 years, the previous 1,000 years, the previous 10,000 years, or the previous 100,000 years. You can go backward in time. The creation of wealth went with something else, the creation of waste. Think of something very simple. You know, I, I am lucky that I teach in a university as wonderful as Ashoka. And I think I'm lucky that I teach an 8.30 a.m. class. A sentiment not shared, I assure you, by any of my students, maybe 1%. <laughs> And I like asking them in the morning, what did you have for breakfast? People take this very literally and they give you an answer. I didn't eat anything or they tell you something. Now, whatever you had for breakfast or will have for dinner contains within itself a very important element, nitrogen. And for centuries, people tried to fix nitrogen in the soil or to increase the quantum of nitrogen available for a plant. Well. In 1908, there was a breakthrough. Like many breakthroughs in the modern world, it was made by two Germans, Haber and Bosch. And they came up with the synthesis of ammonia. And with the synthesis of ammonia, it became possible to increase the quantum of nitrogen you gave the plant uh, in order to absorb. There were other changes. Uh, 
uh, you are in a, a state where agricultural politics is important. I teach in university in Haryana where agricultural politics is equally important. And other than the minimum support price, the price of NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, is an explosive political point. But what we perhaps do not tend to realize is that all the nitrogen that is applied for these plants doesn't get absorbed by the plants. Some stays on in the soil, much leaches into the groundwater, some ends up in the surface water. And one of the great transformations of the 20th century relates to the fact that petrochemical agriculture, which has enabled such large yields, so whatever you ate for breakfast and will eat for dinner, may have benefited from a dowsing of urea, just to illustrate the point, that very nitrogen, leaching in excess quantities into surface water bodies, has led to algal blooms in virtually every water body on Earth, which have deep consequences, not just for the water, but for the organisms that live within it. So the 20th century is one where humans began to have the capability to remake the world more profoundly than ever before. All humans didn't have equal power. Some had more than others. But one of the consequences of technology is that, one, that the same technologies which confer benefits, in this case, better nutrition for the person who eats whatever it was, ragi modde or alu paratha or masal dosa, mm -hmm. also has consequences for other life forms. And the consequences of technological transformation for life forms cannot be viewed in isolation from the material cycles. Think of something which makes uh, news everywhere today, the carbon cycle. I was just talking to a very bright student who said he wants to learn about climate change and he wants to know climate change economics. Now, whatever you do or do not know about climate change, there is at least one prominent politician on earth who has occupied a very powerful position and may occupy it soon, who thinks it's a Chinese hoax, barring a few such as him. I think we would all broadly agree that the pace of climate change has a lot to do with human action and the changes in the carbon cycle. When you think about the carbon cycle, uh, one of the consequences of it is that when the quantum of carbon in the atmosphere increases rapidly, uh, the atmosphere becomes a heat sink. This is not a new fact. It was known widely enough in the mid-19th century for five... Uh, British engineers and botanists and scientists based in this country, including Forbes Loyal, Royal and one based in this city, uh, the great uh, Hugh Francis Cleghorn, to write a, 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 a note to the British Association for Advancement of Science, BAAS, yes, that's right, uh, on the implications of tropical deforestation for global atmospheric change. Like a lot of wise reports, it was heard, it was read, it was filed away and forgotten. But what I think is important is that this increase of quantum, one of the factors driving it is the combustion of fossil fuels. When you stop to think about it, fossil fuels are a result of photosynthesis, similar to the plant which gave us the aloo for the potato for the aloo paratha or the wheat or the rice or what have you. The difference is that these materials had been compressed in the Mesozoic or Jurassic age and they are now being extracted and burnt. There's a remarkable book about to be published by a man called, Char called Mark Schutzer on India's fossil natural capital. And it shows the centrality of India in the fossil fuel transitions of the 19th century. A lot of it is about two coal fields, which have a murky uh, uh, and glorious, uh, murky as well as glorious chapters in India's long history, uh, Charia and Rani Ganj. This is where coal mines were, went underground, you know, you went into the bowels of the earth, you got the coal out and you burnt it. And obviously the consequences are that uh, it uh, has more calorific value per kilogram. Sorry to take you back to class 8 chemistry, but we can't escape class 8 chemistry when we think of 20th century history, can we? But the burning of that then releases much more nitrogen, sulfur, potassium and carbon than the equivalent kilogram of biomass, such as wood. So there are two ways in which you can see the enormous consequences of the changes in the nitrogen cycle and the changes in terms of the carbon cycle. Think of one big contrast between the India of 1900 and the India of 2000. 
The obvious contrast would be that India became independent in 1947. It acquired a constitution in 1952. It conducted elections. From around the 40s to now, India emerges in economic terms as a, as a very major player in the world. But in environmental terms, let's look at two very interesting things that happen. And they happen actually around the late 1960s. One is that for the first time, irrigation water was taken largely not from surface bodies, lakes, ponds, rivers, or even wells, but from tube wells. So in a country where in the 1960s, 70-80% of irrigation came from surface water, today 60% comes from groundwater. And this is the magic of the tube well. The tube well, remember, is powered not by cattle, animal muzzle power, not by humans, human muzzle power, but by fossil fuel drawn energy for the large part. This has huge implications. It changes not just the rate at which you extract water, it changes your ability to grow more crops in the same land, not once, but twice. It also enabled expansion of agriculture into many arid and semi-arid areas. It enabled you, in other words, to grow sugarcane in areas where sugarcane was never ever grown before. The other change is equally related. Um, I was watching yesterday an uh, old Manoj Kumar film, which has very famous song, you know, Mere desh ki dharti sona ugle ugle hire moti, mere desh ki dharti. Manoj Kumar uh, invariably in these films was named Bharat, which means India, uh, in case you, you, you missed that. Uh, and uh, he uh, uh, plays a role of someone who tries to bring ethical behavior into his conduct. This is a particularly interesting song because uh, he's singing happily and merrily uh, and there are people plowing fields and they're being plowed in the early scenes by oxen. If you recall as late as the 71 and 77 elections, the then dominant Congress party symbol was a plow yoked to two bullocks. Hmm? So the bullock provided the traction power. Well, I have news for you, by the year 2000, 70% of the traction power was not provided at bullocks, but by tractors. And it's very significant that the largest market for tractors in India is for small tractors, because the average land holding size is small. 80% of holdings are below one hectare, and about 85% are below two hectares. So there's a huge transformation which takes place in the landscape. Looking at just two indicators, the energy that was used for plowing fields and for transport, it's fossil fuel energy, and the fertilizer that was used to irrigate, to, uh, to raise yields, these were petrochemical fertilizers. I think that one of the fascinating things about India is that by the time India becomes independent, 1947, there had been a very intensive debate, not only on its political future, what would the nature of the polity be, uh, what should be the official link language, should there be one or more than one. Uh, how should the boundaries of India be redrawn within and without? What should its relationship with the great powers of, of the, the world be? But among these is a very big debate, not about how to attain freedom, but what to do with that freedom once it was attained. And I think it can be said that many of the key figures who participated in these debates in the early 20th century were seized with issues which today we may be tempted to label as environmental. Think of the very interesting debate, for instance, between Mahatma Gandhi and uh, his well-known uh, 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 pupil or disciple or follower, Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, you know, in the late 1920s, uh, Gandhi writing to Saklatwala famously, and I paraphrase, wrote that it would be, he would be horrified if India, after independence, adopted the path England had taken. He said it would be the tiger stripes without the tiger. And if uh, 300 million people go down the path a small island nation has, it would strip the earth uh, like a pack of locusts, I unquote. Now, there is much that one can debate about uh, Gandhi's worldview, his maximum program, but it's fascinating to note that his critique is of industrialization as a project per se. The idea, well known to all of you, that mass production is not the answer to poverty, but production by the masses, uh, emphasized that 
small units would lead to self-reliance of the individual. That the charkha, hand-woven, hand-spun cloth, would generate incomes and create a sense of material dignity uh, seemed especially apposite if one keeps in mind that spinning and weaving were taken up by people who were branded as low caste and one should not forget a very large group, such a large group with out property rights and access to literacy would also be empowered in some way and I'm referring of course to women. So I think there was a lot of cultural, social, economic thought behind the project of the Charkha. But closely aligned with it was the notion, not articulated so much in his writings as by that of some of his erudite followers and practitioners, that there could be a different way of alleviating the problem of poverty, material dignity, which is very central to him, I want to emphasize this, by emphasizing not only the dignity of labor, but what we would today call a choice of technology. This is not the terms they use, the term we are using. Prominent among them is, of course, a great son of, of what is now Karnataka, J.C. Kumarappa, who has been written about by many, uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Venu Govindu of the Indian Institute of Science has written a remarkable book about Kumarappa, and I will share with you something, because seeing the attire all of us are using, you might find this story amusing. He reads Gandhi's works, and he goes to a khadi shop, and he doesn't know what to order because he was, uh, remember, a chartered accountant. And I believe chartered accountants then were even more naturally dressed than they are now. They wore a shirt, a coat, and a tie because otherwise, you know, they wouldn't be taken seriously by their clients. And uh, the person there was flabbergasted. He explained there is no size like that for kurta, pajama, dhoti. So he ordered 10 sets. And from then on to the end of his life, he only wore khati. One of Kumarappa's great contributions was to study rural energy in great detail. And some of those studies are particularly interesting when one looks at carbon transition debates. Not that you may take what he prescribed then and do it today. History is never like that. You know, when you're asked what are the lessons of history, what can you learn from the past? So you tempted to say it's not a morality play, you know. It's something little more complicated than that. And uh, I still think that Kumarappa is fascinating because he was arguing uh, this Gandhian blueprint uh, in terms of its implications for resources. Uh, Kumarappa was not without his critics. Uh, if one were to look at those who were to shape India's future, many disagreed with him. One of them was the great Meghnath Saha, who wrote extensively in the 30s, went on to be a member of parliament, a very important physicist, uh, uh, studied uh, uh, nuclear sciences. Uh, there's a remarkable work about the rivalry of Meghnath Saha and Baba which is actually a Calcutta-Bombay rivalry. No prizes for guessing who won and uh, which, which institute got the maximum resources. It was the one in Bombay, not Kolkata. But Meghnath Saha argued that India could not afford the luxury of going down the path which was being sketched out by Komarappa in order to protect national independence. And remember, this is the 1930s. It's an age when militarism of a very open sort not that militarism was new to the great European powers or to the United States, but it was coming up in a more brazen and open form, even within Europe and in large parts of Asia and Africa. I am referring, of course, to the rise of fascist Italy, uh, a war like Japan, and of Nazi Germany. Uh, so the ideas of Kumarappa, therefore, are strongly attacked by someone uh, like Saha, where Saha argues that in order to safeguard your national independence. You'd need at least three uh, sinews of a national economy. N note this very emphasis on the sinew, muscle, bone, you know, very interesting. Uh, he argued it would be iron and steel, power, and chemical fertilizers. It's very interesting, look at the three. Iron and steel, power, and chemical fertilizer. And in a sense, this is what was happening in the 1930s. The 1930s, we tend to forget, are a time when there were huge transformations happening in two countries which would dominate the late 20th century. One, of course, was the now extinct Union USSR, uh, the, the Soviet Union, the, the launching of the five-year plans. And uh, there's a remarkable painting uh, which, like all paintings, is completely inaccurate on one point. The key figure in the painting 
who you would be happy to know was around five foot one or two. He's shown as a much taller man. I'm sure you have guessed who uh, Joseph Stalin. So in the, in the painting, he's a much taller figure, and he's surrounded by people, and they're all staring at this at this landscape. It's a model, and it's called the Stalin Plan for the Conquest of Nature. It was a plan for the extension of development into areas where there hadn't been development. But this is a this transformation of the Soviet Union captures the imagination of many people in the colonized world. Because this was a country industrializing, not through the path taken by the French, the Germans, the British, or the Americans. And I think this is very, very significant. This would play a very important role in capturing the imagination, not just of Meghnath Saha, but of a very great son of this, uh, the former princely state of Mysore, Visveswaraya. So when Kumarappa wrote a famous book, Industrialized, uh, sorry, uh, Kumarappa wrote a response to Visveswaraya's book called Industrialize and Perish. It's not a very widely read book, but the title of Visveswaraya's book would be familiar to anyone from the uh, mid 20th century. It was called Industrialize or Perish. This is not an idea. It is not a slogan. It's the spirit of the times. I want to emphasize this very strongly. This is a time when nationalists across the world are dreaming of a world beyond empire. And in that world, their question is, how will we have the economic wherewithal to protect our political sovereignty when we attain it? This would be common to a Jawaharlal Nehru as much as to a Khwane Akhruma. Uh, it would animate in the 1950s the great Arab nationalist Gamal Abdel Nasser uh, when Nasser takes Soviet aid and builds the Aswan Dam. Hmm? There have been many changes in Egyptian politics after Nasser. The US today counts Egypt as a reliable ally, which it definitely was not in Nasser's time. But the lake that resulted was named Lake Nasser. That name has not been changed. Because for Egyptians, the building of the Aswan Dam, as much as the expulsion of British troops from the Suez Canal and the nationalized Suez Canal was a moment when the Egyptian people stand up. And I think there's something very significant in the early, mid 20th century, in these large engineering projects becoming symbols. Uh, today, we are very critical of them. But we know that many of these projects had ill effects. Think of the Nehru era itself. M. Krishnan wrote a remarkable piece on the wildlife of Tunga Bhadra before the dam. And in a lecture many years later, he recounted how the building of the dam, the very process of building, unleashed destruction in this fascinating semi-arid landscape. By the way, Krishnan had argued that if the cheetah were ever introduced or reintroduced, this would have been an ideal landscape. But he also wrote that the building of the reservoir obliterated that landscape. But even in the process of building, uh, Krishnan, drawing from his notes in the 50s, uh, showed that, you know, the laborers were not paid enough. Therefore, what they did is they went out with a muzzle loader and they shot a wild boar or a gazelle or hares and ate them up. They were not given alternative fuel, so they went and chopped on wood. And the more enterprising among them not only chopped wood in order to burn, they chopped wood in order to sell. So these transformations of the landscape may not have been intended by those who built these hydro projects, but they, these consequences were inbuilt into the way these projects were conceived. You see this much more clearly in the case of displacement of people. Uh, there's a very important event where Jawaharlal Nehru goes to inaugurate the Hirakut Dam. And uh, the dam uh, inauguration had something many of you will be familiar with. When projects are inaugurated in democracies, you have lots of people clapping and you have some demonstrating. So there were 100 people who showed up with black flags. And, uh, uh, Nehru went and talked to them. We don't have a record of the conversation. What we do have is a record of Sardar Patel's letter to two of the members of the demonstration. They were members of the Legislative Assembly of Odisha. And the letter is fascinating. I will paraphrase. Sardar Patel wrote that the issues that have been raised by the protesters are very important. He pointed out that he was familiar with these issues. He had headed the Ahmedabad municipality. And as head of the municipality, he had had to deal with the issue of displacement of cultivators from a proposed airport. And he said that while the issue is important, the mode of addressing the issue you have chosen is inappropriate. He said it's inappropriate because of who you are. 
He said, up to now, our problem was to raise issues and grievances. Our challenge now is to come up with solutions. And he argued that this dam was as necessary as the airport then, but whoever is displaced must get what I am paraphrasing, a life of material dignity. So he urged these legislators to be disciplined congressmen and to stay aloof from all such demonstrations, but to try and address these issues. And I think this is a very interesting view of what is the role of knowledge in a democracy. Is it to oppose that which is wrong? Yes. Is it also to propose that which may be better? Should that which is better be a substitute? The critics may say that building the dam, building the airport, resettling the people is a substitute. You are not changing the fundamentals of the development paradigm, but you are modifying it in significant ways to minimize the sense of loss of what today would be called entitlement by those who lose out. Let's be very clear that in the India that emerged in the 40s to the 60s and even into today, this is a dilemma or an issue which we were and are and will be grappling with. One reason is, and this is where the history matters, already by the year 1600, India and China were among the largest societies on earth in numerical terms. Uh, today, if one looks at India, the density of population is over 400 to a square kilometer. I can't give you a more exact date because since 1881, there's been a diecennial census and in 2021, there was no census. I want to note that there was a census even in 1941 when Asia, Europe, Africa were embroiled in the Second World War. So unlike China, which started censuses late, India has a tradition of censuses going back. But whichever figures you use, 400 to a square kilometer is a lot of people. It's even more if you have that. About 46% of the land is cultivable. So if one were to assume that you need to generate food, fiber, meat, wool, and so on, uh, we are looking not at 400 to a square kilometer, but at 800 to a square kilometer. Let me complicate it even more. In 1947, when India became independent, the lifespan of the Indian male, better fed, better endowed than the women, then, as now, I regret, uh, was 32 years. Today, it is 67 or 68 years. So you have a large population which is living longer. It is true, population growth rates have dropped. The near Malthusian fears of 50 years ago have proven groundless. But you're still dealing with 1.4 billion people. You want to complicate it more, there's very famous biblical saying, you know, buy bread, not buy bread alone. Hmm? But no one will say that you can live without water. If you look at water, India has less than 4 or 5% of the world's fresh water. So it's actually a very small area of land. It looks very large. India looks very large, but it's a lot of people. And here is the interesting part. In the mid-20th century, nobody would have bet on India, or for that matter, China, or Indonesia, or any of the newly independent African countries emerging in the way they have now. Since we are talking about nature, let me share with you someone whom many people may have grown upon as I did. You know, in the 70s, there wasn't much to read on nature and wildlife. You inevitably read books by hunters and the hero of many of us, because he was translated into virtually all Indian languages in the 40s and 50s, was Colonel Jim Corbett. Jim Corbett was sitting in a machan with Lord Wavell. This comes from Wavell's son, who wrote a very flattering biography, as all sons are apt to. And it, it was called Viceroy's Journal. He, he took refuge behind the fact there were pages. And Wavell, evidently, as a very fine officer, kept a very detailed diary of all the conversations. So they were waiting in the machan, the tiger was yet to come, and Wavell turns to Corbett and say, do you think the tiger will survive once we leave? It's a very interesting question. And Corbett said that he doubted it. Then Wavell asked why. He said the tiger would not last more than 10 years. Because in independent India, every Indian would have the boat, and they would shoot the tigers, they would clear the forest, and they would transform the entire area into cultivated space. I'm paraphrasing. But it's fascinating. For Corbett, the end of Pax Britannica, would mean the end of India's wildlife. Because Cobbett, one should not forget, was also a landlord. He was not a privileged white. We tend to think of whites as one category. We owe it to Jeff Ward, who has reminded us that Cobbett was what is called a domiciled Brit. 
You know something very interesting about Corbett? He was a bachelor and he remained one. And one of the reasons he didn't marry, there may have been many, maybe no one wanted to marry him, maybe he didn't want to marry, but had he wanted to marry, he could not have married a white person who had been born in England, in, in Great Britain, because he was a domiciled Englishman. His father, grandfather had been born in India. Now, domiciled whites were just one rung above what are called the Anglo-Indians. You know, when thinks of hierarchies of caste, the caste uh, is about rank, it's about privilege, and it's about privilege based on birth. It's division of the laborer, not of labor, as Ambedkar said. Ambedkar, Dr. Ambedkar may be horrified, but I, I, I think he may even be pleased. We can apply this to the whites in India. Wavell um, was also from titled uh, family. He was a case of an Englishman, who, both of whose parents were England from India. So the English woman from England would not marry somebody like Corbett. And the Anglo-Indians, as you know, were also very important because they were in the railways, they were engineers, they had a very important uh, legacy in terms of schooling and education in India. And one of the Anglo-Indians had a different view from Corbett. He not only stayed on in India for a few years, sadly he retired and died alone in England, he became a member of the Constituent Assembly. One of the other things he did, and did very well, is he was curator for, for the Bombay Natural History Society. I refer to Stanley Henry, Henry Plater, Plater. And Plater in 1948, did something no one in Asia outside Japan had done. Other than Boonsong Lekagul of Thailand, he was the first person from Asia to write a book of the mammals of that country. So when you think of the emergence of India, you think of the flag, you think of the anthem, and you think of various things. One of the ways in which nationalism asserts itself is to take the label of nation and pin it, believe it or not, on animals and birds. And in the 1940s, two men in Bombay wrote books such as these. The Book of Indian Birds by Dr. Salim Ali and The Book of Indian Animals by Stanley Henry Prater. Stanley Prater, of course, retired and went off to England and he died alone over there. E.P. Gee has a very moving passage on meeting him and uh, saying that he, he should never have left, you know, he should have stayed on in India. But obviously, he identified himself more with, with the Raj. But this book is a very important testimony to the fact that there's a sense of Indian nationalism emerging by the 40s and 50s, which includes the animals and birds of India. You see this very interestingly in the fact that as early as 1952, note the year, they set up the Indian Board for Wildlife. They're not quite sure who should head it, so they ask the Maharaja of Mysore. So this is a new role for the princes. The princes are vanishing in terms of political power. He didn't know this. 17 years later, the privy purses would also vanish, as would the hunting rights. But the new role for princes and landed gentry, and people who in many ways identified them, such as the author of the other book, Dr. Salim Ali, was to try and play a role in securing the heritage. In this case, not the heritage of culture, the arts, uh, or of learning, or of ways of living, or dress, or lifestyle, or food, but of natural heritage. And uh, the uh, Indian Board for Wildlife also had a vice chairman. So they have a chairman, and they have a vice chairman. The vice chairman to me is even more interesting than Preta and Salim Ali. It's a man called Dharam Kumar Singhji. Dharam Kumar Singhji was from the princely state of Bhavnagar, which is in Saurashtra. Saurashtra, as the name indicates, is the land of a hundred states. Actually, there are more than hundred. And as has often been said, there were large ones such as Junagar and Bhavnagar, and there were some which were not larger than a few football fields. Uh, Dharam Kumar Singh was fascinating. He was packed off at a young age to study in England. And one of the things he did in England was to pick up an English schoolboy's habit, which I think is deplorable, which was to collect birds' eggs. So you picked up a swallow's egg or a duck's egg or a quail's egg, you put a pin and you took out the yolk and you preserved it. But the result is that he became a very accomplished ornithologist. And in the 1940s, he did something remarkable for the new government of Saurashtra, which was reconstituted as one of the Class C states, he conducted a rapid survey of the fauna and flora of Saurashtra. Now there's lots he wrote about the lion and the black buck and the bustard, but I want to share with you something fascinating he wrote, uh, particularly because so much of today's talk is about trees. He wrote about a hill called Shatrunjaya and a forest which would soon be obliterated for the most part of Acacia tortillus. And he described the honey that was made by the bees from the blossoms of the Acacia tortillus. 
So he was recording a landscape which was vanishing. Many of these princely states, 100 or whatever number they were, had very avid hunters. The rulers of Bhavnagar imported cheetahs from Africa because Indian cheetahs were already becoming very rare. They trained them to hunt in an area called the Bhal. They let the cheetah go and it captured black buck. And Dharam Kumar Singh in the 40s begins to do something very few people have done in the subcontinent. Salim Ali would do on a larger scale. He started ringing birds. He also put away his gun for the most part and took something even more unusual, the cine camera. And he conducted studies, the first ones, of the courtship of the Florican. I find these men very interesting because what they were trying to do was to broaden the canvas of public life in India by bringing the fauna, the flora, the living treasures of the subcontinent into public eye. Uh, on, a, on an aside, in the 50s, there's a debate which would actually be settled as late as 1969 on what should be the national bird of India. Dr. Salim Ali had conducted uh, the studies of the bustard, but the real expert was Dharam Kumar Singh. He even gave number estimates of the bustards in the 50s. Uh, the bustard, by the way, may well be on the way to extinction now because of power lines being set up through the desert. And unless they put the power lines under the un underneath, they will die out. But interestingly, uh, when Dr. Salim Ali suggested the bustard should be the national bird, there was a very interesting article by M. Krishnan objecting to this, arguing that this would lead to a very unfortunate international incident because a slight misspelling of the bird, B-U-S-T-R-D, <laughs> may lead to widespread embarrassment. On a more serious note, he said that hardly any Indian had seen or would see a bustard. It didn't have a name in most Indian languages. A child could not draw this bird. I find this fascinating. The bird for the new nation should be a bird which children can see and draw. He suggested what I think was a very worthy candidate, the Indian minor. He was overruled. We all know what happened in 1969. They made the peacock the national bird. But I'm sure you'll agree that the peacock meets many of Krishnan's requirements. It's easy to see. Most people are familiar with it. I don't think it has a very melodious voice. There's actually an awful Hindi saying very insulting of animals that a donkey married a peacock. You know, you know this, you have heard this, what is the sound of the So the peacock admired the donkey's face and the donkey admired the peacock's voice. This is very insulting to these animals. I think it's allegorical. But to go back, you know, I think that despite all of these ideas, the world of the 50s and 60s is very much a world where development is seen as priority. And the building of the great hydro projects, the opening up of vast areas with fresh irrigation, new techniques of control um, of uh, malaria, uh, new ways of controlling uh, diseases that were rampant, the coming of miracle chemicals. They were miracle chemicals. Prior to racial carson, DDT was seen as a miracle, uh, as was aldrin, dialdrin, and all of these. So I think the 50s and 60s are a time of huge uh, sort of unleashing of economic growth. We don't think of it that way. Uh, my distinguished colleague, who's now unfortunately left Ashoka University, Pulapre Balakrishnan, in a very important book, has shown that the rate of economic growth in the first 50 years of independence was 0.5%, half of 1%. In the first 15, 20 years of independence, it was 4.1%. Yes, India actually grew. And that growth, of course, emphasized heavy industry, steel mills, dams, coal mines, fertilizer factories, and so on and so forth. I think there is a major change in the late 1960s. This in itself should not surprise us. The late 60s were a time of great political, cultural, social, economic upheaval across the world. And many of the dreams of the post-war order were seen as crumbling. In the United States, we see the huge turmoil of 1968, the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, the Black Power Salute in the Mexico Olympics, the Summer of Discontent, um, and uh, the exit of the US president uh, who decided not to stand for re-election. Very unusual in American history, Lyndon Johnson, largely because of the fallout of the Vietnam War. In China, there's the great cultural revolution, unusual because it's unleashed by the man who ruled China, or own, whose name China was ruled, Mao Zedong, who then told his cadres something no ruler in any country has ever said about his colleagues. He wrote a character poster and said, bombard the headquarters meaning get rid of them because I will rule in your name. So it's a time of huge turmoil. And in India too, there was huge turmoil. Uh, the political turmoil is well known to you. The Congress party's majority reduced. It lost power in seven states. Uh, one of them has never got a national party back, my home state of Tamil Nadu. 
there was a communist led uh, uh, communist inclusive coalition for the first time in West Bengal and so on and so forth. But what is significant is that in the late 1960s, there's a reset, both in political and economic terms, but also in environmental terms. And I would argue that the late 60s to the end of the 80s sees a remaking of political power in India with many patterns you might find somewhat familiar today. A more centralized polity, a more dominant leader, an emphasis on technology for transformation, an idea that we've lost a lot of time and we need to take hard decisions now. One of the dimensions of this, which we sometimes uh, tend to forget is, that in environmental terms, this was a time of deep crisis. There were two successive monsoon failures. India was more dependent than ever before on food imports. And little less than 20 million tons gets imported in two years by a country which doesn't have the foreign exchange to pay for it. It's also a time of deep agrarian unrest, not just Naxalbari, but of agrarian unrest and food-related unrest in many parts of the country. So there's a sense that the poor or the underclasses, the sharecroppers, the tenants are not getting their due share. And sometimes their resistance would be met with savage ferocity. I refer only to a village which was well known in, in Tamil literature and politics, but which is better known to the English reading public now because of the writings of uh, the author uh, Meera Kandasamy, uh, Kirwen Mani, where there was a very major uh, killing of a lot of the laborers who were arguing that they had to be paid better wages and they wanted rights. But one of the very interesting responses to this is the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution's origins, of course, are not so much to alleviate hunger but to end a period of dependence and over-reliance on wheat imports from a major superpower whose strategic objectives were at times at odds with an India which was trying to carve out its own path. Just to remind ourselves, uh, in the 60s, in the course of the Vietnam War, the US unleashed chemical warfare on a scale never seen before or since by any country fighting another. I, I, I want to emphasize in an undeclared war. So something like 10-12% of Vietnam was affected by the defoliants such as Agent Orange. And India was one of the countries which was very really outspoken on the need for a peaceful resolution of the Vietnam conflict, including resolutions such as the one in Lusaka in the non-aligned meeting, which specified that chemical warfare was as serious an ethical challenge as the threat of nuclear fallout and nuclear warfare. I would tend to agree because remember the notion that technology, while transforming lives, leaves an imprint and consequences, not only for future generations in this case of humans, but of non-human creatures as well. Similarly, uh, as early as 1967, uh, when the Indian Prime Minister was the only non-communist leader uh, present at the 50th anniversary celebrations of the revolution in Moscow, the statement said that India and the Soviet Union condemned imperialist aggression against the people of North Vietnam, unquote. This led to a slowdown of food imports. The, the import slowed down. Uh, the famously, uh, the White House press secretary uh, briefed the press off record under these things, anonymous not to be named. We know who it was. Everybody does. But what he said is more important than who he was. It said that the president every night, while picking targets for bombing in North Vietnam, also selects which food shipment to India should go through and not, not go through. So there was, there was a level of pressure which is very difficult today to comprehend. And paradoxically, the same Green Revolution would be backed by the United States Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and the same President Johnson. Johnson is very bad at pronouncing names which are not American. And he told the Indian agriculture minister, the great C. Subramanian, he spoke of him. He said that Subramanian fellow is a very good chap. And Subramanian was more candid. He told Dennis Cox years later that Johnson was like a district collector who thought he was a Nawab, issuing orders to do things which we were going to do anyway. So this access to pesticides, chemicals, fertilizers, high-yielding varieties, technology, cooperation was an Indo-American project. 
it's a very unusual moment and of course american uh, strategic interests here were geopolitical and social rather than narrowly military the green revolution was seen as an alternative to the red revolution and it's very significant that 20 odd countries which embraced green revolution technology eventually included and believe it or not vietnam unified under communist rule cambodia and laos some of which now have higher rice yields than india so this technology could be harnessed by different nation states for their own ends this had hu huge consequences which we are all aware of the green revolution of course required large inputs on a smaller area of land for high yielding crops which matured faster and the phosphorus potassium nitrogen stays on in the soil leaches into the water the narrowing of the germplasm base probably is one of the great significance evolutionary turning points certainly in the cultivated spaces this applies not only to the major crops of then wheat and rice but to a range of high yielding varieties now and uh, along with this is the fact that this would widen the disparity between areas which were affected by the green revolution and areas left out and how far would this package work in areas which were arid or semi arid where water was not abundant or in areas where in order to make water abundant you draw down that vast subterranean uh, reservoir of water which had been built up not over decades or centuries but perhaps millennia aligned with the green revolution but the polar opposite of it supposedly was the idea that nature could be preserved by secluding it this is a time of great transformations in the 60s 70s 80s when the area which was protected grew you are in karnataka uh one of the first tiger reserves here was bandipur and one of the features of history is that when you get the new it often overlays the old the old doesn't disappear it doesn't vanish it resurfaces in new form so the tiger reserves were to have core areas which were a sanctum sanctorum humans were not allowed to roam around on foot it was supposed to have nature running its own course and krishnan uh, always very alert to history pointed out that this is not a new idea he he said the venugopal wildlife park for 41 square kilometers had been carved out in the bandipur shooting hunting blocks of the maharaja and forestry had been halted there so this is an old idea of certain parts of princely india there were others mysore is just one case which were built into this notion of the tiger reserve here again you see a similar sort of pattern if nature is to be secured in certain areas even if it is to be secured successfully it may have implications and consequences built into its design and one of the implications built in was that not only in princely india but in former british india the older tradition of forestry which assessed the value of the forest in quantifiable terms how much timber does it produce how much revenue does it produce is reinvented in a new way how many tigers are there in that reserve you know you may be seeing lot of criticisms there are now 53 tiger reserves there are 15 reserves which have no tigers yesterday i was reading on one of the problems of google they keep sending you things even if you don't ask for them it said jim cobbett reserve has the highest density of tigers in in the world so this quantification of things now not in terms of how many trophies you produce but how many tigers cubs are born and how many are raised how many die has its own implications one of them is of course very evident the tiger and its protection was justified legitimized because it was seen as a symbol of the larger pyramid of life by securing the tiger you secured its forest home or its marshland home or its semi arid home and you secured the pyramid of life or the cycle of life within it but you know something 90% of india doesn't have tigers it can't uh, it's either too dry or too cold or too wet or too hot or whatever second tigers are largely forest animals some grasslands include well i have news for you much of india is not grassland forest or whatever is tiger habitat so the tiger casts its own shadow on other life forms the forest casts its own shadow on other landscapes where do you see this better than the fact that the protection and conservation of grasslands of semi arid tropes of deserts of marshes of mangroves of wetlands rarely comes into the public space it gets reduced to how much forest is over there is there more forest or now it's worse if you're a historian who studied forestry people catch you and say what tree is that and you say you don't know they say what's the use of your phd you don't even know the meaning of these three trees 
But the other implication of both of these, or this kind of development, is of course social. The, 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 the notion of conservation is of nature enclosed, being enclosed by the nation state to preserve it, to protect it, to secure it. But is enclosure a form of preservation or is it a form of extermination? I leave it to you. Can preservation be a form of destruction? Particularly where peoples are displaced, aside from their material dignity and rights, important in itself, do we lose certain critical forms of knowledges? We were just celebrating the orality of telling a story of a tree. Now, one of the great things A.K. Ramanujan said is, when you hear a story as opposed to read it, the teller and the hearer are both part of a process. One of the nice things when you tell a story is people interrupt you and say, I think you got that wrong. Or do you really know what you're talking about? Because they think they know it better than you, and maybe they do. And I think that this is something of enormous significance. Because one of the things which happens in independent India is, and a great positive revolution is, many people who never had property got it. You know, we think of women and the Hindu Succession Act. But think of tenant farmers and the great film, you know, I'm sorry I keep going back to Hindi films, but to me one of the great films which was ever made was Do Bigha Zameen, Balraj Sani, who, you know, he dies at the end of the film. The other would of course be Mother India, which if you think about it, it's of a farm family headed by a single woman. It's a 21st century film and of course it's played by the legendary Nargis. In the case of forests, and I want to emphasize this, the extinguishing of rights which took place in the imperial period not only continued but gathered pace in independent India. Private forests, Zamindari forests, Malgozari forests were also brought under the penumbra of the Forest Act. And it was only as late as 2006 that this began to be corrected. By the end of the century, we are in a different era. The world of the Cold War went away. The Berlin Wall fell down. We had then been told that liberal democracy has won. And the free market has won. It's a great book written by Francis Fukuyama, The End of History. Today, 30 odd years after that, I don't think anybody would say with any certitude that history has come to a full stop. There's a debate on what is liberal, what is a democracy. There's a debate on whether free markets really work. But more importantly, particularly in the post-89 world, the question of human predicament, the human uh, endeavor, attaining a better world, cannot be addressed unless, unless one addresses the question of the environment. It's not an issue of the survival of the bustard or the tiger or the forest or the mangrove. It's about modern civilization itself. And many of the presuppositions and premises of that project of industrialization are today widely being questioned. What do we have in its place? Is it a substitute or an alternative? What do we mean by the notion of an alternative? Alternative to what? Alternative for whom? Alternative for how long? I was struck by that parable of the Krishna fig tree. You know, the ficus tree has one very important characteristic. However long humans live, there are people who claim to be 100, there are people who claim to be 120, 160. The tree, if allowed to live, will outlast us. So what happens when you think of longer time spans? And India is an obvious country, think of longer time spans. We have oral traditions which go back 10, 20, 50 generations. We have traditions of production or livelihood which also go back a long way. So what can we draw from our past when we think of subcontinental transitions? I'd end with just two points and here I want to go back to Rachel Carson who I think is a fascinating person for the way she fused the culture of science and the culture of literature, knowing nature and how it works for the moment just just keeping nature as the non-human. Let's just assume that's it. It isn't, but let's assume it is. But the idea that the way in which you describe it, explain it, tell it, is aesthetically pleasing. And she had a wonderful line in one of her writings. She said, in nature, nothing stands alone. It's such a redolent line. It says, in nature, nothing stands alone. In history, nothing stands alone. When we look at nature and history and the past of the 20th century, what is it that you can extract as some sort of insight into the future? One of them is that one cannot look at human history without looking at the biophysical and the larger environment in which we live. The other is that the consequences of actions live on long beyond the time they are taken. 
they have both expected and unexpected consequences. And being better informed about this is the least that we can do as we imagine a future which draws from the past but is markedly not just better but different from it in a positive way. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, uh, please identify yourself and then please. Yeah. Hello. Sir. Yeah, Yo, thanks for the wonderful recap. It was amazing. Um, a lot of things I learned today. Thank you very much. Um, just wanted to understand, you also talked about, you know, uh, Tiger being the apex uh, uh, predator and, you know, pr protection of it is actually protecting the forest, right? So, uh, and you also said 90% of that is not protected by, do, don't have tigers, right? Um, so, what was the play of this uh, Wildlife Protection Act 1972? Uh, and that was something that I was thinking probably had some play. So, just your thoughts on that. Your name, sir? Sorry, my name is Kannan. So the Wildlife Protection Act is very important and uh, Dr. Ranjit Singh, who was uh, it's, uh, the man who mostly wrote much of it, has done his memoirs and I'm happy to say the contemporary archive of contemporary Indian Ashoka, we have his papers. And one of the things the Wildlife Protection Act does is to, it just draws up three, four schedules. The tiger goes into schedule one where it's completely protected. You can't capture it dead or alive without special permission and there's a number of other species put there. But the act bears uh, the stamp of the past. Something he's very ashamed of today, it has an entire section called vermin. And since we're looking at urban wildlife, it includes bats. So we're supposed to kill off all the bats, which, which I think is an atrocious idea. Uh, so the Wildlife Protection Act is very important. It, it is very similar to acts in several countries. Recently, someone was very critical that he read up the Kenya uh, Wildlife Act. But, but why not? I mean, Kenya is a former British colony. We're trying to draw from it. But the WPA is a very important act. And the... Before that, there was, no unif there was no federal legislation. So the national parks or the wildlife sanctuaries had been created by state uh, legislation. So this creates some sort of uniformity at the All India level. But forests and environment were still a state subject. They were added to the concurrent list where the federal government and the state both have a say, but the federal government has a greater say only in 1976. Uh, so I think it's a very important act. There have been many criticisms of the act, but we can go into that later. But I, I think your question is very important because the Project Tiger Steering Committee, the, the task force report, comes out the same year. And the secretary of that committee is the same person who drafted the Wildlife Protection Act, Dr. Ranjit Singh, who, by the way, was the princely family of Vankaner, nephew of Dharam Kumar Singh. So it's very interesting, Indian elites are actually quite small. You meet one person, poke them a bit, and you find they're related to someone else. <laughs> I mean, everybody's related to someone else, but you know what I mean. So. Yeah. Hello. Sir. Uh, my name is Pratul Joshi. I am from Lucknow and uh, came here to listen to you. Uh, uh, there is a concept of green budget, mm. which was introduced in Kerala, mm. where 10% of the budget was allocated for the greenery of the state. Mm. But this notion could not uh, take uh, much roots in other states. Mm. Uh, what would you say about this? Because uh, uh, when one state in India is introducing and their environmental concerns are very high, but uh, no other state copied it. Thank you very much. So I will answer as a citizen. I, I know nothing about budgets and financial issues. See, this was raised by a meeting of Himalayan states in the UPA period, when states such as Himachal, Sikkim, Jammu Kashmir, Arunachal pointed out that they had a very large percentage of area under forest cover. But they lag behind the country in per capita income or GDP. And uh, they felt that the federal government and better off states, please note many of these are states which are among the poorest states in the union, should pay them for this. 
And I want to emphasize when Project Tiger gets set up or when these reserves are designated. Uh, you know, the area that is, uh, was designated originally as core, governments had to forego a lot of revenue. So Nagarhole or Bandipura gave a lot of revenue to the state government. That money had to come from somewhere and they were not compensated by the federal government. So I would turn this around and argue that in a large, diverse country, when we think of transfers from less, from more well-off states to less well-off states, we should also keep in mind that regions and areas which are historically disadvantaged, which have a better endowment of biodiversity, should get the resource from richer states and peoples. What countries such as India urge the at the international level should also be done at, within the country. As for the rest, sir, I think it's a larger question than setting aside a portion of the budget. We know from the work of the last 50 odd years that the idea of development or the ideas of development need to be rethought, not only in terms of what they mean for the present, but the future. It's a very important slogan of the UNEP. It's a very nice slogan. It's very complicated once you try to actualize it. it said development without destruction. So destruction of what? Development of what type? But there's something very, very significant in that. And the Brundtland Commission, of course, tried to argue that you have development, but try to see it's sustainable. And I think this idea of that 10% is trying to address it. But obviously, it needs to go much beyond that. But I think it's a very important point, And we need to look at state finances. And I think one of our dilemmas, even the way I've been speaking today, we look at India as a whole when much of our life has to do with state governments. 60, 70, 80 uh, percent of our lives has to do with the state. Depending on which state you live in, things are vastly different in many ways, as they should be. So it's a very important question, sir. Thank you. But we need to look at that further. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, sir. My name is Deepak, and I'm from Rajasthan, and the great bus study is the state bird of Rajasthan. We call it Godavan in mm. Rajasthan. Mm -hmm. Actually, I haven't seen it because it mostly found in uh, desert area of Badmir and Jaisalmer, right? Actually, my question mm -hmm. is that why are the cheetahs not surviving in Madhya Pradesh? And second, a small one, please uh, give mm -hmm. some tips to how to remember all these details. Thank you. <laughs> I, you are asking the wrong person. My, my, I, I've been told by members of my family my head is full of useless information. I can't remember my I can't remember my credit card number and I know only one or two phone numbers. So that I can't help you with. You know, aapko ek sawal pe aapko ghor karna chahiye jis panchi ya pashu ko pratik banaya jata hai kya pratik banane ke saath hamara jo kartav hai wo samapt ho jata hai. When we make something a symbol, is our duty over with it? And you do wonder, because the period since the time the Godavan became the state bird of Rajasthan, its condition has worsened in every possible way. Now there is a very large breeding effort, which has been successful, all credit to them. But it's very nice if you breed the bird, but what if the habitat vanishes and the bird vanishes in the wild? I don't think cheetahs dying is news. I think animals die. And uh, large carnivore being taken from one environment to another, some element of mortality, fatality is to be expected. The question is, could there be better ways of managing them and their upkeep? And I am not a veterinarian. I am not a wildlife biologist. I have never seen a cheetah except in a zoo. But if you wanted to be logical, you would ask one question. See, the cheetahs were brought from Namibia and South Africa. Before they were brought, many respected, eminent, fine biologists and naturalists suggested that they would be killed by leopards, hyenas, wild dogs, tigers, etc. Not happen. That they would be unable to hunt Indian prey, not happen. You see Divyabhanu Singh's book, the new edition, end of it, the cheetah in India, there are pictures, very interesting pictures. In the first few weeks, cheetahs have managed to hunt and kill Sambhar, young Nilgai, black buck, chinkara, and one more animal, I forget which one. The question is, how are they going to be kept? And uh, last week, two cheetahs went to Baran district, they were tranquilized and brought back. Cheetah went into Madhav National Park, tranquilized and brought back. Cheetah crossed the border into UP tranquilized. These cheetahs are very important. They have not attacked a single human being. They have not attacked livestock. And can we think of free roaming cheetahs? They have radio collars anyway. Because if you think about it, India has the largest number of free roaming tigers in the world. One third of the tigers are outside reserves. It has 
30,000 square kilometers today has lions on it. 10 districts. If you go to the web, there's a photo of a lion roaming around in a car park 140 kilometers from Ahmedabad. It's actually looking at the cars. You wonder for a moment, it's going to lie down under the car. It doesn't. It just walks away. So I think, you know, we need to rethink this question of how these animals are kept. And it would be unfortunate if they are only kept in these bombas. And I, I don't think this is only a question of government. Uh, having worked in the media, I, I do think many of us are complicit in this because you keep asking, where is the animal? Uh, I, I don't know if you watched the programs when they were being brought. I watched one of the channels and a couple of friends were vastly amused because they were asked four or five times on the channel, what will the cheetah do when they release it? Will it go outside? Do you think it will remember its home? This is the level of public debate. You know, and if, if, if a cheetah dies, it's very unfortunate. We should find out, did they put the right collar? But it's not a crime if it died. You know, this is a, there's a short-term demand of immediate results. So I think the answer to this is, this is a 10, 15, 20, 25 year project. And it would be very important if the best scientific knowledge is used, the best administrative practices are used, and as Professor Asmita Kabra has pointed out, people in the Kono area are also brought on board much more than they have. I mean, there are efforts to bring them on board. I'm not saying there aren't. So I don't have one answer, but some, the question is, are they able to raise a new generation uh, and will that generation reproduce? There's no quick answer to this. It's a very complicated task. It's very significant they're doing it. You know, I do have one request. We should have some questions from the women in the audience also. <laughs> I, I, you know, I've been observing in the last few places, except in universities. In universities, it's completely different. I think you should give some credit to the students. I'm not taking away from you all. Sir, please go ahead. Sir. That's not uh, a comment on you, sir. Yes. Uh, before the ladies take over, uh, my name is Murli Dhar Rao. Sir. I've been reading your columns uh, wherever they appear quite regularly. Now, my question is, uh, can we have this regenerative forest, like in Scandinavian countries, and, and I'm told those forests also have wildlife and wildlife tourism. Hmm. So is that possible in any part of India? I'm just, that's a question that I have. I believe all the IKEA furniture hmm. is used using those kinds of forest uh, wood. Hmm. Thank you. No, one can have regenerated landscapes, no doubt at all. Uh, if you see Delhi, uh, Professor C.R. Babu, and the Center for Restoration of Degraded Ecosystems. There are nine biodiversity parks. Uh, two of them have reported hog deer and leopards uh, for the first time in many years in Delhi. And definitely it's possible, and they, there is no reason recreation cannot be there, provided it's of a low, low impact variety. There are vast areas of the landscape in countries such as India, which could uh, be regenerated. I don't want to use the word restored. And this 30-30 idea which has come up, you know, in COP28, Kuming and others, if one doesn't keep 30% of land in terms of exclusive natural area, that I don't think is a workable idea. It could be disastrous. Could be even more than 30. Why not? It's, it's a very good idea. And it could be places of different patches, different sizes. And this may have another very important aspect. Uh, we are in a city where there's very important uh, initiative uh, headquartered here on birds. There are similar issues of butterflies and plants and trees. This could also be a means to engage many more people, not just in monitoring what species there are, but of learning to observe them. So I think, you know, the absence of observation of natural history, not just writing down which bird you saw, but what those birds do, you would also be trained to know to observe what they do. That's very important. I'm not a trained observer. Definitely, sir. And I do think the Scandinavian countries are very important because one of the features of Sweden, uh, Norway, Finland, Denmark is that these ideas have been built into their systems from very early on. So, you know, in the 1930s, when Swedish social democracy came up, uh, pardon the expression, there's a remarkable law called every man's right to nature. It's an extraordinary law. By the way, the Swedes now are quite English friendly. You can read it on the web. It seems if you walk through, uh, you have the right to walk through private property, but you're not allowed to pluck berries or flowers or litter it. And the idea of walking was to appreciate nature. There are many things one can be critical of Israel about, but one of the features of the Zionist movement, and again you'll be surprised, the Palestinian movement today is, both of them place a lot of emphasis on appreciating the beauty of the birds and the plants. 
And uh, it, it may strike you as a remarkable coincidence that the national bird of Palestine and Israel both is the same, the hoopoe. No, I'm not, you know, so I think this is a very important idea. Regeneration not only as a biological process, but as an educative process. And this definitely would be something which could bring societies together. You know, one of the people I have heard with great profit, different world, is uh, the former director of Prithvi Theatre, Sanjana Kapoor. And one of the things she said in a talk is that Maharashtra is the only state in India, every uh, municipality has a public theatre. It's free. You don't have to pay rent. You have to put your name in a register. You can go there and practice theatre. And the idea in the state of Maharashtra, which was set up in 1960, is that theatre will bring people together. They will appreciate culture and literature. And there are theatre festivals. And she says this is very difficult. In most parts of India, people who do theatre can't find a place to practice. They've got to go and ask someone who has a warehouse or beg some school principal. So I think that what about the theatre of the outdoors? And, and I do think that, to me, the kind of walk we were being told about, we are celebrating a very great man, but we should think of this as a practice and institution. So the regeneration, not just of the fauna, flora, avifauna, but of that civic process. And that's something very critical in Scandinavia. They have an incredibly active public space, uh, much more, uh, by the way, than some of the larger, uh, more powerful European countries. It's something very admirable about them. Yes, ma'am. Yo, the mic. Um, sorry, um, but thank you, uh, Professor. I'm sorry, where's, where are you? Just wave or something. Ah, right up yes, here. And in your the front. name? Huh? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Ojasweet. Sorry, Ojasweet. I'm a student, but sure. not of history. Sure. So um, during your talk, you mentioned that like there were some things like iron and steel, power, chemical fertilizers, uh, for which um, like at the time, like as I understood it from your talk, I think like there was kind of a consensus about what people or like the country felt about their need and like mm. their effects. Mm. But uh, like today, I think like many of us would agree there's different perspectives on that, like many broad ranging effects, especially on the environment. Mm. And I was just wondering like, uh, as somebody who studied a bit of like environmentalism, was there any similar like uh, like dissenting, I would say, thoughts or perspectives about the Green Revolution as it was being proposed and set up? Hmm. So that's the question. Always. There's never a complete consensus on anything at any time. There'll always be critics, and some critics may be in-house. I'll guide you to something very interesting. The All India Radio organizes something called the Sardar Patel Memorial Lecture. There are two lectures. In 1970, it, it was called Synergy in Indian Agriculture. And the speaker talked about the long-term effect of pesticides, the need to develop organic pesticides, and to look at soil health in a consolidated, holistic way. And the speaker was the late Professor M.S. Swaminathan. In fact, he wrote about this as early as 1968. And uh, you know, he had suggested, because I'm in, working in Haryana, I have to say this, you know, this crop burning of stubble, which is a big issue. Uh, he gave an interview two years ago, it's on YouTube, to Pallav Bagla. He had suggested long ago that the stubble should be collected, farmers should be paid for the stubble, and if mixed with molasses of certain types, it's a very good feed for cattle. This was not followed up. So, of course, he is an in-house critic, but there were people from outside. There's Fukukoa and others who have ideas of organic agriculture. So, absolutely. There was never a universal consensus on anything ever in history. The consensus is broad, and even those who go ahead with something, there'll be a debate among them, which is good. There should be division. I mean, I, I don't believe there should be consensus which is so complete that there can't be critics, dissenters, and debaters. So debate is very crucial to democracy, but yours is a very, very good question. What are you a student of, ma'am? Life sciences. Life sciences. This is an excellent question, ma'am. One question in front. Last one. One last one. You know, Sorry. of course, they say Gandhi, Gandhi was Your waste. Your good name, ma'am? I'm Nishka Ratnam. I've been media all my life. Uh, of course, they say Gandhi was a waste for um, you know freedom. He was as much of an environmentalist. But my question really to you is about carbon. Uh, there was a time when we were you know in a position to uh, power the world for carbon points, and then I don't know what happened. Pachauri himself came and said to me, you know, Nishka, it's getting a bit uh, out of hand. Carbon points, you know, the carbon rating. What really went wrong there? I mean, the, our, our was, ours was like second highest in the world. We were bidding at a second highest rate in the world. 
And then I don't know why Pachauri himself sort of felt that it, something was going wrong and maybe we shouldn't blackmail the world about our carbon. Uh, I honestly don't know very much about this, but let me let me show you, you know, today or yesterday, the uh, report by the energy minister saying that India will be self-reliant in carbon by 20, in coal by 2025. We'll be extracting a billion tons of coal because we'll save on foreign exchange. So there is a conflict in state building between expanding the size of your economy and the environmental costs of how you carry out that expansion. It's very simple. You know, there's a very famous or infamous saying at the end of the Second World War, Churchill was trying to get the better of Stalin. So they were, they were actually scribbling on a note, or notes on a pad. And Churchill wrote, because there was an interpreter, they were dividing up which area for the Americans, which for the French. And he said, what about the Pope? And Stalin, I don't know if you know, Stalin originally was trained to be a priest. He'd been in a seminary. He said, the Pope, how many divisions does he have? It's a fantastic It's like the Gabbar Singh dialogue, kitne admi the. Of course, Stalin didn't know there was going to be a Gabbar Singh. Today, you don't ask only how, how large their military is. You ask, what's the size of the economy? And I think that there is a built-in tension in the world, which you should think about. This tragedy of the commons, which has been applied to hapless herders and fishers where it probably doesn't work. Does it apply to nation states of the world? If all nation states compete to increase the size of their economy, will there be size for all their economies together? Is earth room enough? Now, it's unfair to pin this only on India. I, I completely buy that. But the question then can be reframed. What are the forms of economic expansion which can be inclusive, equal, but inclusive equal not only of present generation and class, gender, caste, etc., but also inclusive and humane to the future, future human generations. Not, let, let's not get even to other, other creatures. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that whatever India is doing, it's a huge emphasis on renewables. China is also a huge emphasis on renewables. It's a very difficult, uh, you know, the, the deck is stacked. And, and the sense you get when you look at Developing countries which we develop, developing country leaders will say something which I'm sympathetic with, that time seems to have stacked the deck against us. We're not catching up with them, we're catching up with time. But at what cost? And at whose cost? And here is the problem. Given the geographical location of India and the particularities of our climate cycle, higher levels of energy efficiency both in immediate, medium and long term, maybe in our enlightened self-interest. Both of the poor and the middle class and the rich. This is my view. But this is a very large topic which I know very little about. So, another time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Rangarajan, for that masterful panoramic view of the 20th, 20th century's environmental history, but also so much more. Um, one has the sense of you know, seeing the world in a grain of sand. I feel like uh, this morning in this lecture, we've actually seen all of the 20th century. I um, um, wanted to also thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see um, a full house, standing room only. Um, you know, uh, Priya here just said to me that Tabe Buyas are all in bloom in Bangalore, and every Tabe Buya she sees reminds her of Vijay. So. Um, with that, I'd like to leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you.